Good morning. We're going to start with a song. If you guys want to stand up and sing along and clap your hands with us. Welcome to church. I'm excited to see all of you guys here. I'm excited to be here. Excited that all of us are here. Thank you, Jesus.
think about those words as we're singing them. Sing them to the Lord. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil thy word. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our very soul. Holy Spirit, come and made us proud. We are your church. We need your power in us. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire. Win this nation back. Change the atmosphere. Build your kingdom here. We pray. Well, good morning, Kathy. Why don't you keep playing that chorus if you would, okay? How many of you glad that you came to church today? How many glad that all these other people came to church today? Why don't you say hi to about two or three people that you have not met, okay? Introduce yourself, and even if you have seen them before, just say, hi, my name is, okay? That just takes the awkward, like, I should know your name, but I don't remember your name. Go ahead and welcome each other. We're going to continue on in just a moment here. church. It's good to see everybody here this morning. So we have some really fun things coming up. Um, I know the slide had the date um, discrepancy, but next Sunday we will be having a missions breakfast. So that will be at 8.30 to 9.30. Um, the youth will actually be serving this breakfast and it goes to Speed the Light. So next Sunday, 8.30 to 9.30. So um, also, in your bulletin, you will find a ton of different things, how you can connect. If you looked at your bulletin this morning, there is a wide variety of things. So if you are unconnected, please connect yourself <laughs> with anything that's in here. I promise you will not be disappointed. Um, also, on the back of the bulletin, there is a list of nonprofits and different um, organizations that River of Life partners with for Giving Hearts Day, which is this coming Thursday. Um, so if you want to take a look at that, there's some great, great organizations, um, just to name a few, Adult and Teen Challenge, which is very prominent. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of that. The Women's Care Center, which is right here next to this path, the Hope Center, um, just a lot of great organizations. So, and if you have, um, if you're an employer, if you are employed with certain organizations, sometimes they'll match your giving. So just check into that. And um, yeah, and that's about all I got this morning. It's good to see everyone. We're going to go back into worship. If you guys would like to stand up and... Uh, focus on the, we're going to have the words up here and just focus on the Lord this morning and giving him praise because he is worthy. He is worthy of all of our praise.
today we make the conscious choice 
to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Regardless of the day we've had, the week we've had, Lord, today we fix our eyes on Jesus because we need to. God, reveal more of yourself to us today, we pray. We know that you are our source. Thank you, Lord. You can go ahead and have a seat just for a moment. This morning we are <clears throat> sharing together in communion. I want to read uh, a passage out of Matthew. The interesting thing in the Gospels when it talks about where Jesus instituted or, or started what we now call the, the Lord's Supper or communion is in Matthew, it, it's, it's interesting that, that the, the verses before, and this is in Matthew chapter 26, in the section before, in, in verses 14 through 25, it talks about Judas betraying Jesus, Jesus celebrating Passover with his disciples, and then verse 26 through 30 talks about Jesus Again, this where he institutes this and kind of shares the pattern, the model that we use. And then after that, in verse 31, then Jesus predicts Peter's denial of him. So right in between a betrayal and a denial is where Jesus talks about his body being broken for us. This last week we had the opportunity, Monica and I had the opportunity to be with, um, there was a rabbi that was in town. And... Uh, Several of the pastors and different ones were invited just to spend a couple hours with him. And so we went and spent about three hours on Thursday afternoon. One of the things that he talked about that just caught my attention is in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 30, it talked about the blessing and the curse. One of the things that caught my attention was that God knew this. people were right on the very verge of going into the promised land. This was the end of their wandering, and they were going into the wilderness. And God said, I'm going, to, I'm going to bless you. There's blessings and the curses. I want to bless you. But long story short, he basically said this. I know you're going to fail. I know you're going to drop the ball, but I'm going to give you grace anyway. He knew before they ever went into the promised land that they weren't going to be able to make it on their own. And he made a way anyway because God is a God of blessing. God desires to bless God wants to bless. We don't have to beg and plead and try to convince Him to, to give us something good. He is a good Father that gives good gifts to His children. So as we enter this time of communion, I just encourage you just to come to Him today as a good Father that gives good gifts. In John chapter 26, starting with verse 26, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread blessed and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take eat, this is my body. One version says, this is my body that was broken for you. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. This whole idea of the, the body being broken for us. Sometimes we say, why, why is it that we do communion so frequently? And honestly, we don't do communion probably as frequently as we should. Because I believe that one of the things that God knew, and Jesus knew even when he instituted this, is that we have a tendency to forget. Anybody have problems with that? We have a tendency to forget. And God said, I want to put things in place that continually bring back to your mind what it is that I've done. This is one of those. Is that we come together, and Jesus said that as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death and he'll come. Do this in remembrance of me. And one of the things that I want to make sure that we understand, first of all, if you are new with us or new to River of Life, you don't have to be a member of River of Life uh, to participate in communion. What we do ask is that you've just committed your life and made that choice just to commit your life to Jesus. And you are part of the family of God. We'll give you the opportunity even for doing that, that today. 
But the Bible also says that when we take communion, that it's a time for us to kind of examine ourselves. Say, so God, is there, is there any betrayal or denial that, that I've harbored or that I've practiced in this last week, last couple of weeks? And let's bring that back into alignment. And the good news is, is that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So would you just bow your heads and just close your eyes. In just a moment, I'm going to have the ushers come, and they're going to begin to distribute these uh, different elements, the bread and the cup, again, representing the, the blood of Jesus and the, uh, the, the bread representing the body of Christ. Just ask that, uh, again, that you hold on to those. We'll all be sharing those together in just a moment. I'm going to have Monica come up here in just a moment, and we're going to be uh, just leading as we all partake together of that. Parents, if your kids are here, just leave it completely up to you. If you want to have your kids participate, that's we, we welcome kids to participate if they can understand what they're doing. But Lord God, we take a moment and we remember. Lord, we remember that because of what Jesus did, You saved our life. May we never take that for granted. We may never think that that's no big deal. We are alive spiritually today, free from the consequences of sin because of you. So, Lord, as we share together just in the next few moments, God, I pray that you would reveal more of yourself to us. Lord, you'd also bring to our attention those things that maybe we've kind of deviated, maybe some attitudes, some thoughts, some behavior that really is not very becoming of a follower of Jesus Christ. Lord God, we thank you that your grace allows for forgiveness for that. If there's anyone here today that you have not committed your life to Jesus, you can do that even before we take communion today. I just encourage you, the Bible says that if you confess in your mouth and believe in your heart that God, that, that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So you can do that right where you're at. Say, God, I just recognize I need Jesus today. Thank you, Lord. Oh, what an incredible privilege it is to come together to share this time. Now supernaturally do what, what no man can do. In Jesus' name. Ushers, would you come? Worship team is just going to continue to lead us just in worship. I encourage you just to fix your eyes on Jesus. Again, just hold on to the elements until everyone has been served, and then we'll be sharing together in just a moment.
God, the risen Savior, oh, be still and behold Him. Hold the bread representing the body of Christ, the physical body that Jesus experienced such incredible torture for us on the cross. When we look at the scriptural account of that, and we've seen and heard kind of the depictions of the crucifixion, that he was beaten to the point where he was almost unrecognizable, almost didn't look even human as, as much as he had been beaten. And some would say that what exactly could be beautiful about that? And looking with our physical eyes, there was nothing beautiful about that at all. But from a spiritual perspective, when we see that, that he did that for us, out of love and compassion for us, his body was broken for us, that's a beautiful thing. That is an amazing thing. Not just for me personally, but now I can come together, and I'll be talking about this this morning, I can come together with other believers the church, those that all have accepted Jesus Christ as a personal Lord and Savior, that is a beautiful thing. The church is a beautiful thing. I want you to understand that. The church is a beautiful thing. The body of Christ is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And that's the privilege that we have today. So let's take that bread. And God, thank you today for the body. But thank you for the body of, of Jesus that was, was sacrificed, for the physical body that endured such incredible punishment for us, Lord, that we deserved. Lord, the stripes that we deserved, the beating that we deserved, the condemnation that we deserved, the guilt that we deserved, the consequences that we deserved. And yet you stepped in and took our place, and we thank you for that for that is a beautiful thing. And Lord, thank you for the, the church, the body of Christ that we have been adopted into, the family that we are now a part of, the relationships that we can now experience, the encouragement that we can find because of what you did on the cross. So Lord, as we share this bread together, we remember what you've done for us. And we say thank you. Let's share together in bread this morning. And Father, we just come with the cup in our hand, realizing Lord, you did this because of love. You love us, and you sent your son not to condemn us, but to save. So you reach out your hand to us to come. So I pray, Lord, that no matter what failures, betrayal, or denial that we have made against you or others, I pray, Lord, that we would come to receive the restoration and forgiveness that you freely offer because you love us. So we just thank you for shedding your blood that can be applied to our hearts and lives for the forgiveness of our sins. In Jesus' name. Respond to that chorus, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Worthy, worthy, worthy to receive all praise. Holy, holy, holy. 
is the Lord God Almighty. Worthy, worthy, worthy to receive all praise. One more time. Holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Worthy, worthy, worthy to receive all praise. Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, the Church, out of the abundance of your heart, can let your mouth speak right now. If you want to sing, go ahead and sing. You want to just declare praise to Him. Let's just do that this morning. Let's just fill this place with praise. If you want to lift your hands in gratitude to Him, Lord, we praise You today. Lord, You alone are holy. You alone are worthy. You alone are all-powerful. Lord, we praise You today. We declare Your goodness today. Thank You, Lord. Just the voices to sing. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Worthy, worthy, worthy to receive all praise. the Lord God Almighty, worthy, worthy, worthy to receive all just believe even right now, God by His Spirit is just moving amongst us and just healing bodies. Some of you are feeling that right now. You came in here with some physical illness and you might be feeling like a heat or a warmth in that particular area that's been giving you problems. I believe that that's God right now. That's the Spirit of God that's just pouring out healing in your body right now. Just receive that. Just begin to just declare His praise. That he's a good father, that good good gifts. He knows exactly what we need even before we ask it. to worship. I just, how many of you are feeling that? I mean, you're, you're sensing something right now. It could be a physical thing that just God is just doing something. Those of you that do, I just want you to embrace that. Just continue. Just continue to focus on the presence of God right now. God is a good God. He just, He heals us even when we don't ask for it. Just because He's a good God. He knows exactly what we need. So let's just hold tight just in the presence of God. I believe He just wants to do some supernatural miracles here today.
That's right, church. I just, I just believe that God wants us to worship. If you want to sing, sing. But let's lift, lift our voice right now. Don't let somebody else do it for you. Just, that's right. Just fill this place with worship. continue. Just continue. I believe God just wants us to hold tight right here. Scripture says they, wait. they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. I believe that there's some of you just need to renew your strength today. Just wait in the presence of the Lord. Just begin to declare His praises. Holy, holy Just the voices. Let's sing this right now. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. stand and sing that again just in reverence for him. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Our 
song shall rise to Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Lord, what an incredible privilege that we have to be a part of the body of Christ, to worship together, to come together and sing praise to you. Lord, thank you that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Lord, thank you that our strength is in you, our hope is in you, our peace is in you, our healing is in you, our joy is in you. Lord, it's all you. It's all you. It's all you. So, Lord, thank you. Thank you that we have the privilege to come together today. Lord, we ask that you just continue to reveal yourself through us continue, Lord God, in our kids' church today, Lord, that they would just learn truths, Lord God, that are going to transform, not just the way they think, but the way they behave. Lord, thank you for the kids that are in the nursery. You speak blessing over them right now, everything that happens in this place. Lord, may you be honored and glorified in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Why don't you say, uh, if you haven't already, say hi to somebody next to you. Say, hey, get ready. Church has just begun. We are glad that you're here. Again, I know that you already shook hands, but uh, you can do it again. We're not opposed to people shaking hands twice. Let's go ahead and head back. Monica is back there, so kids can be dismissed for kids' church. <clears throat> Hey, thanks for joining us today. We are glad that you're here, whether you're in person or online. I am, uh, I am glad to be back. And those of you who here last Sunday, know that uh, I was uh, down for the count last Sunday and uh, woke up just with incredible dizziness. I shared with some of you, I don't know what your feelings are. If you've experienced dizziness, I am convinced there's one place in hell. That's what you feel for eternity. I hate, I hate, 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 hate that feeling. But uh, anyway, thank you for your prayers. Appreciate Aaron uh, Phoenix stepping in and uh, taking care of things and so many of others taking care of things uh, last week. And uh, so let's, let's just continue. I want to just continue to be praying, uh, really just healing and protection uh, for ourselves, for our family. Just out of curiosity, in the last month, how many of you have personally experienced or somebody in your family has experienced illness? Okay, look around. It's all over the place, okay? We just need to pray together as the body of Christ, again, for each other, uh, just the, the healing power of God and the protecting power of the blood of Jesus uh, over our bodies. Again, we want to just uh, make sure that we remember those that are not able to be here today. Some are watching online probably because they're not feeling well. Uh, but let's just continue just to, to pray that life-giving uh, healing power of Jesus uh, in our lives. Um, just real quick, uh, we are in a series right now uh, just on purposes and priorities. And uh, so if you've got your Bibles, uh, you can go ahead and take them out. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10 is going to be the passage that I'm looking at. Uh, actually, before we do that, a couple of quick announcements. Hey, Lucas, just right from your wet, just stand and just tell us real quick about the men's retreat that's coming up. Uh, men, we want you to pay special attention to this. Go ahead, Lucas. All right, so we want to make sure, again, there'll be more information on our Facebook page. Uh, you can register on that. We'll have a group of guys that are going out there together. The other is, uh, just before I get into my message, I want to just uh, <clears throat> give a quick announcement, is that we have been blessed at our church uh, with, uh, with incredible uh, godly leadership that's part of our deacon board. Uh, we've got four individuals that are currently serving on our deacon board. We meet at least once a month, 
And uh, I, I turn to these guys and call and text them frequently throughout the rest of the month, just getting input from them. Our current deacon board uh, is uh, Rick Woodrow, Mike Durbin, Ulysses Jones, and Nathan Fritz. Nathan just head back to a kid's church. Uh, those are our current deacon board members. Uh, just a quick announcement. We got our annual meeting that's coming up uh, in March. And uh, again, just uh, save the date on that. Uh, we'll get more details about that. But uh, one of our deacon board members, Mike Durbin, is going to be stepping down. He'll be done the end of February. And uh, as our Constitution allows, what happens is when someone steps down from the deacon board, the current deacon board can appoint someone to fill that role. And uh, so the deacon board has done that. And uh, we are announcing you today uh, that, uh, that Larry Becker is going to be taking the term that uh, Mike Durbin is going to be vacating. Uh, so we appreciate Larry and his willingness to serve in that capacity. Larry is not here today. We just continue to be praying for uh, him. Marcin had uh, knee surgery this last week, and so he's home uh, taking care of her. But uh, uh, So Larry will be joining us uh, the first part of March. And uh, then in, at the annual meeting in March, Rick Woodrow's term will be done, and we'll be electing another board member uh, to fill that. But I want you, again, just to, if you get a chance to thank the deacon board members uh, this is not uh, a real glamorous position. Uh, we, don't, we don't come together and just have parties and cake and ice cream, uh, you know. I mean, we have, enjoy our time together, but uh, there's just some, some stuff, and some things you've got to talk about. So just uh, thank, one of, thank the deacon board members uh, for what they do. And uh, again, I am just, we are so blessed just as a church to have godly people. Yes, that would be awesome. Thank you for that. The other that I want to mention, and they're not doing this, obviously, for any kind of attention or, or uh, any kind of uh, recognition, but I've just been so pleased with our worship team, um, and we've got a number of people that are part of our worship team. We met in November and talked about just a variety of things, and, and from that meeting, actually, in November, it was kind of common consensus among the worship team that we just don't have enough time uh, to, to practice on, on Sundays to be musically ready and spiritually ready. They would usually come at 9 o'clock, kind of be done by 9.30. And uh, so we kind of made the decision we're going to kind of work towards some things. So actually starting this morning, uh, the worship team came 30 minutes earlier. And from this point on, they're going to come at 8.30 and practice from 8.30 until 9.30. And uh, uh, that, now I don't know about you, okay, but so just, okay, just think for yourselves, okay, that, that means like 30 minutes earlier than normal, Okay. And uh, so I mentioned it to them, but I want you to let our worship team know too. They did this because they believe that our worship experience on Sunday morning is important. And they recognized as a team, we need to be as best prepared, not just musically, but spiritually as well. And uh, so they, they were the ones actually, I didn't, I didn't bring this up. They were the ones that said, hey, how about we come 30 minutes earlier on a Sunday? Because it was so tough to find another time during the week. Uh, that everybody was available. So uh, talk to one of the worship team members. Let them know that you appreciate what they're doing, the commitment that they've made to our worship experience. And uh, uh, we can do that right now, actually. That would be fine. we got a great worship team. Let's show our appreciation for our worship team members. Some are not able to be here today. But I just believe that God has got some great things in store for us just as, uh, as a church as we continue uh, to, uh, to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Well, I think, uh, Caleb, do I have a prayer? I think I got a slide for the prayer on there. Okay, I don't remember if I include that or not. This is a prayer that we've been praying for the last couple of weeks. Uh, let's, uh, let's read this prayer together, can we? Lord, I choose to embrace and pursue your purposes today. Change my desires and awaken a hunger for your presence and a thirst for your word. Open my eyes and ears to see and hear what I have never seen and heard before so that I can experience you in a way I have never experienced you before. Spirit of truth, lead me into truth today so that I can be better at loving people and sharing Christ. Our series on purpose and priorities, the purpose of River of Life Assembly of God is... There you go. It's right on the screen there for those of you that weren't paying attention, okay? <laughs> this is why we exist, okay? This is why we do what we do. We do everything that we do to experience God, to love people, and to share Christ. The last couple of weeks, again, if you missed any of those messages, I encourage you to go on to either our webpage uh, or our YouTube channel and uh, watch those, uh, the messages we've been talking about, priorities. Here's our purpose, but what are our priorities? Again, the priority we talked about 
Uh, two weeks ago was the Word of God and the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Today I want to uh, talk about the priority of life-giving relationships. In Hebrews chapter 10, starting with verse 19. Hebrews 10, verse 19. Everybody got it? If you got it, say, I got it. Okay. For those of you that are waiting for your dollar, I'm not giving you a dollar today. Those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, never mind. Okay. Hebrews 10, starting with verse... Actually, let's start with verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood, holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another in so much the more as you see the day approaching. There is a word that we have encountered over the last year, two years, that we have used before, but probably not anywhere to the degree have we heard it or seen it like we have recently, and that word is the word essential. Essential. Essential, the definition means absolutely necessary or extremely important. Most of the context of the conversations and things in which we've seen this word in the last, again, year, two years, has been in discussions or news articles or in public policies trying to identify what is essential, what is non-essential. Essential businesses, non-essential businesses. Essential workers, non-essential workers. Uh, all of these things, this crisis that we have experienced in the last couple of years has really focused people's on attention on really having to identify what are the priorities? What is essential? What is important? This pandemic of the COVID-19 has, has revealed priorities individually, nationally, and spiritually. And in some ways, it's been a good thing. In some ways, it's been a little bit telling that some of our priorities have kind of been, a spotlight has been put on them. We realized, again, individually, corporately, nationally, spiritually, that some of the things that we have placed as priorities probably shouldn't have been placed as much of a priority as they were. Brett McCracken in the Gospel Coalition, he had a webpage, he said this, it's telling that our society has decided we cannot live without essentials like liquor stores, marijuana dispensaries, and golf courses, but we can live without the physical church gatherings. That's one of the things that has come to light is how essential is the church, how essential is the church gatherings. In that conversation and in the climate in which we've been uh, living in, many have begun to believe the lie that, that the physical church gatherings are not only non-essential, they're dangerous. It's dangerous to go to a large group of people. Some have carried that, that lie into all relationships, believing that all relationships are non-essential and dangerous and risky. And I say that that's a lie because that is absolutely contrary to the Word of God, and that's the priority that I want to talk about today. The priority today is the river of life. Our priority is in life-giving relationships, which means that we will promote, nurture, and engage in life-giving relationships and stress the importance of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I think I've got a slide on that. If you want to put that up, guys. We will promote, nurture, and engage in life-giving relationships and stress the importance of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, as we look at the book of Hebrews, I want to give a little bit of context in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews was written to a group of believers that were under pressure and persecution and some of those Hebrew believers were starting to wonder if it really was worth it to continue following Jesus or if they should just go back to their, their old rituals of, 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 uh, uh, of Judaism. 
the writer of Hebrews, which most likely was, was the Apostle Paul, is writing a letter of encouragement to them, basically saying, it is worth it. We did a series on this a while ago uh, called Greater Than. That's really the theme of the entire book of Hebrews is that Jesus is greater than. He is worth pursuing. But throughout this epistle, again, the, uh, which is in a letter written by an apostle, the author points out the priority of Jesus. Jesus is greater. And these Hebrews that were trying to decide on their priorities and where they should put their time, effort, energy, money, Paul is encouraging them saying, yes, yes, it is, it is worth it to pursue this. Now, in the, the book of Hebrews, there are a number of, of warnings that are included throughout the book of Hebrews. There is a warning against not valuing salvation. This is in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. I think I got this on a slide too. He, a warning against not valuing salvation. Hebrews chapter 2, 1 through 4. There was a warning that the apostle was uh, writing to the Hebrews about deception and unbelief coming into the church and into believers' lives. That's in Hebrews 3, 7 through 14. There was a warning against spiritual apathy and immaturity, which is in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12, through uh, uh, chapter 6, verse 20. There was a warning against sinful behavior in Hebrews 10, 26 through 39. And there was a warning against disobeying God's voice in Hebrews chapter 12, 25 through 29. Now, the reason why I put this on the screen is I want you to look at that and I want you to consider, do you think that any of those issues right there are potential dangers for the church in America today? Are we in danger of not valuing salvation? Is there risk of deception and unbelief? Is there potential danger in spiritual apathy and immaturity? Is there risk in sinful behavior, disobeying God's voice? And it's interesting to me that as, as long ago as this was written, how relevant and prevalent it is to us individually today and certainly as a church of Jesus Christ. In the passage that I read in Hebrews chapter 10, starting with verse 19, the writer recognized the challenges that the believers are facing, and again, he, he's, he's writing them to encourage them. He's not, he's not saying, get over it. He's not diminishing or saying, it's no big deal. No, they were facing some very serious persecution. They were facing some very serious threat, and, and the writer knew that. So he wasn't discounting that. Actually, the, the writer of Hebrews, he actually says, you know what, I recognize the persecution and the challenges that you're facing, and he actually kind of lets them know, get ready, it's probably going to get worse. He doesn't say, you know, just hold on for another week, hold on for another month, and, and all of these risks will go away. Just, just hold tight, and, and, and in the next year, you won't have to worry about deception and unbelief or not valuing salvation or spiritual apathy and immaturity. You won't have to worry about people opposing your message, people persecuting you, people coming against the truth of the Word of God. Paul doesn't say that. He recognizes the threat and he says in the midst of it, here's what you're going to have to do if you're going to come out on the other side of this, fulfilling what God has called you to do and fulfilling the purpose to which God has called you to. The apostles very clear that pursuing God's purposes will not be easy, nor will it be without sacrifice. He was telling the Hebrews that, and I believe that he's telling us the same thing. It's a wonderful thing to say that, yeah, our purpose is to experience God, to love people, and to share Christ. But I'm also here to tell you the reality is, is that that probably will not be easy, and it is not easy. And that probably will come with some sacrifice. If we, in fact, are going to experience God, if we are going to uh, love people, if we are going to share Christ, there's probably going to be some sacrifice that's involved with that. Perfect example that I already mentioned is the worship team coming 30 minutes earlier. Why? Because they're sacrificing. Because we want to experience God. Somebody said that to continue to do what you've always done, you will continue to get what you've always got. And if we want anything to change in our spiritual lives or in our church, in our, our nation, 
it is going to require some effort on our part. It's going to require some diligence on our part. It's going to require some change on our part. We need to have a plan in place in order to persevere to the end because, again, those challenges are going to become even greater. So the apostle lists a couple of let us statements in the passage that I read. One of them is, in light of all the things that are happening, let us draw near to God with a true heart in full assurance of faith. He's saying, first and foremost, your relationship with God has got to be a priority. Draw near to Him. We talked about this already. Scripture says that when we draw near to Him, He will draw near to us. Let us draw near. He also says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. And it's in that section that many of us know the verse, Hebrews 10, 25. It's in that context that says, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. See, the apostle is writing and saying, if you are going to persevere in fulfilling your purpose, it is going to require you to be in relationship with other believers, and it is going to require you to be involved in life-giving relationships. So what does that mean exactly? Life-giving relationships really, in its simplest form, is, is those connections, those relationships that deposit more value than they withdraw. There's a difference between life-giving relationships and life-taking relationships. There are relationships that we have all experienced that are life-giving. We add, uh, get more value. We are encouraged when we are around these people. And we have all been in the life-taking relationships when we leave and when we, uh, we're not around that anymore, that we recognize that was a life-taking. I feel more exhausted and emotionally depressed because I was with those people. We've all encountered the Eeyore people of the world, that there is something wrong with everything. There's just kind of this cloud over their head. And the Bible's not saying that, that we completely disassociate with those. Obviously, I mean, Scripture talks about that those are the very people that need to hear the message that we have. But at the same time, we need to place a priority on, am I getting more value and more encouragement poured into me or am I around people that are continually draining me? Because if I'm continually around people that are draining me or in those life-taking relationships, eventually, if they keep taking value and taking life from me, eventually, I don't have much more to give. And I cannot give out of my emptiness. And it's in that context that Paul is talking about the importance, again, of life-giving relationships. Just a couple characteristics of life-giving relationships. Life-giving relationships are those where there is mutual respect and appreciation. Life-giving relationships are those relationships where we call each other up rather than calling each other out. Where it's saying, hey, you can do better. Let's, let, let's work together on this rather than pointing out the mistakes and the failures and the flaws. Life-giving relationships, there's, there's healthy boundaries and expectations there are certain things that I will do, certain things that I cannot do. Life-giving relationships are those that, that, that uh, 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 have a level of honesty and acceptance. Life-giving relationships are those where there's apology and forgiveness, a recognition when we've done things wrong, and a forgiveness when people have done things wrong to us. Life-giving relationships, there's a loyalty and there's a trust. Those are the kind of relationships that the apostle is talking about in Hebrews chapter 10. Those are the kind of life-giving relationships that we're talking about when we say that this is a priority for us. Now, I recognize that we are all human, and every church, unfortunately, has human beings as part of it. I mentioned before, you probably heard me say, that were it not for the people and the pastor of River of Life Assembly, we would have a perfect church. But as soon as you get people involved, it gets messy. If you're looking for a perfect church, let me just tell you, you will probably not find it. And I don't mean to be harsh, but if you do find it, as soon as you start attending, it will no longer be perfect. 
because people are not perfect. I understand that. But this is, this is kind of the ideal. This is the goal to which we want to set ourselves of those life-giving relationships. Now, to give us a little bit more appreciation for this, what are some characteristics of life-taking relationships? Life-taking relationships are often one-sided and selfish. Life-taking relationships are filled with criticism and judgment. Life-taking relationships are filled with jealousy and possessiveness. Life-taking relationships are, are filled with lying and manipulation. Life-taking relation, relationships uh, are those where, where individuals seldom take responsibility and often blame someone or something else. Life-taking relationships, there's, there's easily, uh, they're easily angered or maybe even to the point of abusive. Those are life-taking relationships. And those are the relationships that we need to stay away from us. Away from. Most of us, again, have experienced life-giving and life-taking relationships, and some have experienced more than one than the other, which is why it is so critically important for as a church body is that we do everything we can to create environments where we have life-giving relationships rather than life-taking relationships. Why are life-giving relationships important? Why is this a priority for us as a church? Why is this something that we need to pursue individually, corporately, community-wise, that the importance of life-giving relationships? Life-giving relationships accelerate God's purposes in our life. When we are involved in life-giving relationships, the purpose to which God has called us, we are able to pursue that and accomplish more sooner in a life-giving relationship. Life-giving relationships keep us focused on God's purposes in our lives. It is very easy for us to get distracted from what God has really called us to do, especially if we're never around life-giving relationships and those people that have got a similar purpose and a similar focus. It, it, it keeps us focused on why we're here. It keeps us focused on the experiencing God loving people and sharing Christ. Life-giving relationships protect God's purposes in our life. Because those life-giving relationships are ones that, that when we start to deviate or when we start to stray from, from that purpose from which God has created us, we have life-giving relationships that, that will call us and say, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm noticing I haven't seen you for a while. How you doing? You seem to be down a little bit. Is there something that I can help you with? They, they protect that, and they, they get us back on track to where we need to be. Along with that, life-giving relationships hold us accountable to God's purposes in our lives. It's when we are in those life-giving relationships, we have to uh, be able to tell other believers, and we hold each other accountable for, for doing what we said that we would do. You know, there's been a number of, of programs, whether it's weight loss or exercise or diet or whatever that might be. They're, there's all, they're all great programs. But one of the things that I discovered is that any one of those, regardless of the strategy or the plan, it seems that the one key element that makes them all effective is accountability. So let's say that you're wanting to lose weight and you join a Weight Watchers, okay? And once a week, you got to go to a Weight Watchers group and get on a scale and tell everybody else in the group about your eating habits in the last week. There's a level of accountability there. That if I know that i got to tell other people what I ate this last week, if I know that someone's going to ask me, then I'm going I'm to do what I can to follow that plan. One of the things that I've discovered about accountability is everybody wants accountability until somebody holds them accountable. Because it's not a pleasant thing. Oh, yeah, I need, I need you to hold me accountable. I need you to hold me accountable. If you see me doing this, let me know. And then they let us know and say, just shut up, okay? Who are you to judge me? Well, no, I mean, you, you asked me to do that. Life-giving relationships hold us accountable. And that, again, is what the apostle was talking about in Hebrews chapter 10. He said these life-giving relationships, he said, do not neglect to meet together as is the habit of some, but encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word neglect, some versions say not forsaking 
It means to, to leave in the lurch, to abandon, or to desert. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Do not abandon. Do not neglect. Do not push to the side as unimportant relationships with other believers. God, through the writer of Hebrews, is commanding us to promote, nurture, and engage in life-giving relationships. If there is any place that life-giving relationships should be evident, it's in the church of Jesus Christ. That's what draws people to the church. Not because we're perfect. Not because there isn't anybody that doesn't have any issues or any problems. But because even in the midst of those challenges and those problems, there is still a love and acceptance in all the characteristics that I mentioned just a few moments ago. There's something appealing about that. Scripture talks about that is they shall know us by our love. They come and they say, you know what, man, these people, they really, they really enjoy each other. They like each other. They, they respect each other. God, the creator of the universe, hardwired you and me to be in life-giving relationships. Because the nature of God is relational. God's nature, his character, is relational. The Trinity, the Godhead, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, those are, those are relational terms. It's the character of God, the, the nature of God is, is relational. Of all the ways that God have, could have chosen to relate to you and I, He chose the language throughout Scripture of family, of relationship, father, son, daughter, heirs, children, adoption. All of these things are relational terms because God is a relational God. God created Adam, Genesis chapter 2. Even after he created Adam, he recognized in verse 18, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. And isn't it interesting? That the one area that, that God placed as such a priority in this relationship, again, that, that we were created in the image of God. Therefore, we are relational people as well. Isn't it interesting that was the one area that the enemy attacked Adam and Eve in was in their relationship. Their relationship with God, but also their relationship with each other. Remember the story? Eve took the fruit. God came down and said, what have you done? Adam said, that woman. That woman that you gave me. She, you think that affected their relationship? Probably. Isn't it interesting that the enemy attacked in the area of relationship? Isn't it interesting that God created us to experience a life-giving relationship with him this was, this was the Garden of Eden, the perfect relationship with God. That the enemy came in and destroyed and stole that relationship so there was a separation. That God in his infinite love and his infinite mercy desired so much to be in relationship with us that he made a way through his son to die on the cross so we would come back into relationship with God. And so this, this value and this priority of God to be in relationship with us and with other believers now, again, as we talked about in communion, as the body of Christ coming together, that God valued us as a body and the relational aspect of the church so much that he sent his son to die for it. And yet, isn't it interesting that the relationship that God sent his very son to die for, it's so easy for us to really not pay much attention to at all. It's just kind of optional. It's kind of if I have time. It's kind of if I feel like it. Jesus gave his life for the church, and yet we don't think it's important. Contemporary Christian artist Keith Green, some of you familiar with him several years ago, he really had a way of stirring up the church in a lot of ways with some of his music, but one of the lines that he's got in his song was Jesus rose from the grave and you can't even get out of bed. 
See, there's a danger. There's a danger in isolationism. There's a danger in removing ourselves or being removed from the body of believers. Matthew chapter 9, it tells the story of Jesus coming into the city and says when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless. And here's an interesting phrase, like a sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Jesus was moved with compassion because he saw people that were isolated and they did not have any life-giving relationship. They were trying to make it on their own. You know, the the analogy of of that sheep, they they were like sheep without a shepherd. I did some studying and Do you know what a sheep's primary defense mechanism is? I mean, you don't typically think of sheep like harsh and stay away from them. That one's got sharp teeth. Uh, No, I mean, sheep are pretty docile, pretty tame. I mean, you really don't think much of a a sheep that, I mean, if it's it's faced with danger, what's it going to do? Bow? I don't know. What what does a sheep do? And looking at at, uh, some information about sheep, The number one defense mechanism of sheep is to run. Along with that, and here's interesting, now again, this is from actually, it was a webpage on sheep. Along with that, sheep have been created with a a high sense of paranoia and danger. So they can recognize danger from a long ways off. Why? Why? So they can run. That's, that's their defense. Is our defense is there's danger. Run. It isn't hold your ground. We're going to take. But here's the third thing I thought was interesting. Okay, Number one defense, they run. Number two, they have a highly de- developed sense of danger. So they can kind of sense that something's wrong. But the third one is they stay in the flock. Because they know that the chances of a predator attacking all of them are slim to none. So they stay together. And that's how sheep are able to stay healthy. And yet, all of us, Scripture talks about that, all we like sheep have gone astray, each one to his own separate way. We've isolated ourselves from other believers. We've isolated ourselves from from those life-giving relationships. And we think that, that we can make it okay. Isolation. In isolation, it is all too easy to both hide our sin and feed our sin in secret because of all these characteristics already. What, why, are, why are they important? Holding us accountable? Because I can isolate myself. Not only can I be involved in sin and nobody else knows about it, I can feed my sin and nobody else knows about it. In isolation, our loss of relationship leads to a lack of discipline. And our lack of discipline leads to an indulging in sin. Sin thrives in isolation, which is why we need to discipline our bodies, which is why we need to be around other believers. Sin thrives in isolation. Don't believe me? Talk to some mental health professionals and find out how the last two years has played out with people as they've isolated themselves. And at all this time, to be thinking about and acting and feeding their addictions, their sin, whatever that might be. Being deceived, thinking that I'm actually, I'm protecting myself by staying away from all those risky people over there, which the most risky thing that you could ever do would be to separate yourself from other believers. There's four environments, just as we wrap things up, four environments, four environments of life-giving relationships that every person must have. One of them is one-on-one relationship with Jesus. Apostle Paul talked about that. Let us draw near to God. Your time with Jesus has got to be top priority. Second one is a spiritual friendship with at least one or two other people. 
That spiritual friendship, just someone else that you can talk to. It may be your spouse. It may be another family member. It may be uh, a Sunday school teacher that you had years ago, whatever that might be. But a close friendship with one or two other people that you can be honest about and that you can share when you're going through the good times and the bad times and know that they've got your best interest in mind. The third environment is a discipleship group. That group of maybe 5 to 12 people that are coming together on a regular basis. And again, you're talking, you're encouraging one another, uh, you're building one another up. You, you may be spending time in God's Word. But, you know, sometimes we, we over-spiritualize this and think that any time that as Christians, when we get together, we have to have a Bible study, when the reality is as Christians, any time we get together, it's already a spiritual time. Now, I'm not saying anything against Bible study, absolutely not. But there's value in just getting together and doing things with other Christians, not just studying the Bible. That discipleship group. And then that fourth environment is worship with the church body, coming together like we are here. And some, I understand, when we look at these, the one-on-one -on -one relationship, the, the spiritual friendship and the discipleship group and the, the working with the worship within the church body, it's easy for us to say, well, Pastor Kevin, you don't, you don't understand my, my schedule. You don't understand my time. Uh, I, don't, I don't have time for, for all four of those. And so we pick one of those, and maybe that, that one that we pick is the worship with the church body, so we come to church on Sunday, but we're not involved in any one of those others. Or maybe we pick, you know, I don't really need to go to church because I've got my time with Jesus, and that's all I really need. Well, I'm glad that you got time with Jesus, but let me tell you this, you need to spend time with Jesus' body as well. You need to spend time with his church. That's the way he wired you. So when we come down to it, let's be honest. If I can be this blunt, some would say, I don't have time. I don't have time to be in those four relationships. Well, let's be honest. Busyness is not keeping you from those four relationships. Comfort is. I'm too comfortable to spend time with Jesus because that would mean that I need to wake up a little bit earlier, stay a little bit later, stay up a little bit later. I'm just too comfortable. I would rather not do that. I'm too comfortable to actually spend time and get to know one or two other people or getting in this group or whatever that might be. It's not an issue of busyness because one of the things that I've discovered, and I'm sure that you have too, you have time for what you want to have time for. And you need to understand, we all do, the importance of not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as some are in the habit of doing. Because you cannot make it on your own. Nor can I. It's impossible. That's why Paul is saying, I'm not, I'm not diminishing the persecution and the challenges that you're facing. Paul is actually saying, the apostle is saying, that in the midst of all this, it's even more imperative that you be together with other believers. He said, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves as some are in the habit of doing, but even more as you see the day approaching. What that's talking about? It's talking about the end times. It's talking about the rapture. It's talking about the, the, the increased pressure, the increased challenges. And that right now, how much more are, are we in that situation now than we were even at the writing of the book of Hebrews? Our participation with other believers should not dwindle. It should actually increase. The day and age in which we're living in requires it. According to Hebrews chapter 10, if we place our personal comfort over God's command to meet together, we will be judged accordingly. See, meeting together is not optional for God. Getting together with other believers is not optional. He said, do not, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Do not neglect getting together with other believers. Do not overlook, push to the side is unimportant. But encourage one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Kathy, you want to come to the piano if you would? As we wrap things up, let's do that uh, build my life if you would. As we wrap things up today, I want to just, are we, are we online? We're online. Let me just address our online group for just a moment. The rest of you can listen. I'm so glad that we got the online option. And even last week, the last couple of weeks, there are people that were sick or not feeling well that commented and said, I'm, I'm so glad that we're live streaming so I could participate uh, in the church service. And I'm glad that we're able to do this. 
And some of you, again, you are watching online. Some of you that are here today, you've watched online because you were sick or unable to be, be here in person. And I, and I get that, I understand that. But there's some of you that are watching online and that's all you're doing is watching online. You need something more than to watch online. You need to be with other people. And I'm not saying that you got to come to this church. You need to be with other believers. A, vir a virtual relationship is not going to cut it. And those of you that are here in the sanctuary, you know that. A virtual relationship, it's, it's not the same. It can't be the same. It, it was never meant to be the same. And so I'm glad that we have that opportunity to connect. And our goal is to connect with people online, absolutely. But our goal is to not to keep them online. Our goal is to connect them in life-giving relationships with other people. That's our desire. It should be for all of us. So as we wrap things up, here's my question. First of all, the life-giving relationship, of course, that we place at the top priority is a life-giving relationship with the person of Jesus Christ. We talked about that during communion. Four environments. One of them is just that one-on-one time, one -on -one time with Jesus. If you have not done that, I encourage you to do that. Saying, I, I, I just commit my life to Jesus. I can't make this apart from a relationship with him. But others of you looking at these four environments, you probably say, you know what, I'm doing pretty good in, in that one. Or maybe doing pretty good in that two. But I'm not doing so good in that one or, or those two or whatever. Where do you need to make adjustments? Now let me just say as well, let me back up for a moment. I have met with a number of pastors. One of the advantages and privileges that I have is I'm presbyter for our state. And so we, actually this week, will be interviewing a number of pastors that are seeking credentials with the Assemblies of God. And one of the questions that I ask the pastors that I interview is, who do you have in your life, apart from your spouse, I'm just assuming it's your spouse, but who do you have in your life that, that you can talk to about kind of the good, the bad, the ugly, kind of when you're facing a challenging time, you got somebody that, that you can call that, that can help you in that. And over and over again, you know what I hear pastors say? They say, I've always wanted that, but I don't have it. To which I tell them, find it. If you're going to wait for somebody else to come to you, you may be waiting a long time. You need to find somebody else. You need to. And we're going to create as many opportunities as we can. And I understand we, we can't say, okay, you and you get together, like each other, share each other's deepest, darkest secrets now. Okay? It doesn't quite work that way. I get that. Okay? Somebody said that even, even for matchmaking, you, you can't you can't make a couple fall in love. But you can create opportunities where they're together. And maybe that will happen. That's really what we're doing. We're trying to create opportunities for you to come together on a Sunday where maybe you fall in love with Jesus a little bit more. Creating opportunities with our small groups or whatever that might be so, so you can connect with some other people. On a real practical note, Okay? There's some opportunities that are coming right now. Men's retreat is coming up. Guys, let me just say to you, this is, first of all, I am a guy. Okay? I recognize this whole life-giving relationship thing. We kind of tend to pick and choose. I'm fine. I'm good. Now we need each other. Things like the men's retreat, where you just go together and just like throw hatchets together or something. Right? There's hatchet throwing. Okay, I thought that was part of it. Okay? Okay? There's something that happens with that. We've got a group of guys just meeting on Fridays. We've got a ladies' connection. They just met yesterday and talked about the events that are coming up for the next several months. There's a lot of opportunities. We can't make you come. We can create the opportunities. So I want you to do this. If you take out the, the response card that's in the literature holder in front of you, I want to just take a moment and just ask, what is, what is God challenging you to do? And on that response card, again, you may or may not turn that in, okay? If you want to, that's fine. But I believe that some of you, God has even challenged you saying, you know what? I've, I've wanted to start like a small group or, or just a group that, 
uh, that, that goes through whatever, one of the right now media videos or something like that. I've wanted to do that. I've just never known how, okay? Right on that note, I would like to start a small group. Fill that card out with your name. Give it to us, and, and we'll do everything we can to, to get you connected with that. Maybe it's, you know, I wanted to participate in a, in a small group. This is one of the things that we're working on is we, we need to have more opportunities. You say, you know, I'd like to participate in one. Well, let us know. Here's the thing is we, we can't have small groups if we don't have small group leaders. We can't have these environments if we don't have individuals that are interested in leading those environments. We cannot have the, the ladies, what, what do you guys call it on Saturdays at Dunn Brothers? Saturday Sisterhood, okay? Okay, we, we can't have those opportunities unless there's people that are actually willing to go to Dunn Brothers on Saturday and kind of facilitate that. You need other believers, and I do as well. So just take a moment in that response card. Say, God, what, what do I need to do? As a result of this, what do you want me to start doing, stop doing, or do differently? And those of you that are watching online, same thing. What is God challenging you to do right now? What do we do with this message? We just say, well, that was good, but none of my behavior is going to change. I'm not going to get involved in any more groups than I was before. And it really didn't accomplish much. So God, thank you for your truth. Thank you for the life-giving relationship that we have in the person of Jesus Christ. And thank you that as a church, we have a privilege and an opportunity, but at the same time, a responsibility to promote, to engage, to nurture life giving relationships. Thank you, Lord. Let's stand together this morning, can we? If you need to find some place to pray, the altars are certainly open. I encourage you to do that. But here's my challenge before you leave. I want you to find at least four or five people that you don't know their name and go introduce yourself to them, okay? And let's just all get over the awkward right from the very beginning because I know part of the awkward is I've been sitting in the back row.